Hello. Welcome, Professor Johannes. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's always good to have you and have you at a time where you are um, in the time. doing something that is, uh, some would call it insane, but I think we'll call it, you're listening to something and the way that you're doing your courses, you're writing each lecture that is, is it to become a, it, it's basically you're writing a book and you've been doing that with each lecture or uh, with each, each course that you've been doing. Isn't that true? Yes, I think almost every, yeah, almost every course, um, except for the uh, early Greek thinkers courses, which was only seminars and no lectures. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the next time I'll teach that course, there will be four or five written lectures then. Um, sometimes you do need a break from writing, but it's, it is true. I mean, so the course that's coming up now is German idealism, which is a natural succession to early Greek thinking. Uh, just to tell the anecdote that probably everybody knows, the um, Herdelin, Hegel, and Schelling are roommates mm -hmm. in Tübingen in the late uh, 18th century, and they read Heraclitus together. Herdelin writes into the Stammbuch, into Hegel's diary, mm. one and many, but there are other notions from other words from Heraclitus, the unfolding of the one into the many and the folding back into it, yeah. etc. Uh, this is what sparks what we now call German idealism, of course, based on Kant and Fichte. Um, but yes, yeah, so what I do is I write uh, a, a book, basically, and then about, about yeah, about half of what I'm writing makes it into the lectures. Mm. I did that with the Nietzsche course last year. Um, and I think it's what, what should be expected of any good academic, right. but which is, no longer, <laughs> yes. which is no longer possible right. in academia because you have to make PowerPoint presentations yeah. uh, and have to, you know, quote all the right people, et cetera, et cetera. But, when you look back, you know, people like Ernst Cassira and Paul Natorp, the Neo-Kantians in Marburg, Paul Natorp was the gentleman who, who held Heidegger get a position there. If you look at Martin Heidegger himself, some of the best books from him are lecture courses. Hmm. And you, you know, he cannot imagine, or Hegel's aesthetics, for example, Hegel's aesthetics is a lecture course, or his, or Hegel's history of philosophy is a lecture course that was just given to students who happened to be at the right time in the right place. Right. Um, and I would like to, so, and I thought this is what academia is, of course, you know, it turned out to be a bit different. Right. So I, the ironic thing, and I've said this before, is that I'm doing something very traditional or old fashioned, mm -hmm. out of fashion, mm -hmm. but in a new medium, perhaps. So. Yeah. And I'm in a tunnel. I told you before we started recording, so I'm in a tunnel right now. I'm finishing up the last lecture on Hegel right now, so which oh. is the pinnacle. Yes. The pinnacle of German idealism. It's, it's all coming. Together. Yes. It's something that's never happened before, right? Like there's a, it is, it's interesting when you look at the German idealists. And you read, as reading Schelling and, 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 and Hegel and, I mean, they're doing something that is seems so radical, um, like especially Hegel. My God, <laughs> it is. Well, yeah, and the wor the worst one of them, of course, is Kant, right? The old Prussian. Um, no, but I mean, not the worst one, but the the it's. Um, where should one start? 
Well, what, I'm just curious. Well, what what is it that as you're as you're um, as you're writing, as you're researching, right? What would you say that like what if you went okay? What what was it when you started all this, right? When you started writing it and doing the course, right? What did you what were you, what did you think German idealism was? And like as you're writing it and working it out and listening to it, what, what are you hearing that's deepening what you thought or other than what you thought? Like, what, how is it showing itself to you? Um, so I should probably mention a few people. I, I studied it, I did a PhD at Warwick um, on, on Heidegger with Miguel de Bestigui. And I had a very good teacher there called Stephen Holgate on, uh, he's a Hegel scholar. Um, and I, and he teaches, which is rare, he teaches the Wissenschaftslogik, the science of logic, so-called. And I took the course for four years in a row. Um, and realized very early on that it's, very necessary to have a good grounding in uh, Kant and Hegel and Fichte and Schelling, especially Hölling, of course, to uh, to understand Heidegger, but also um, other philosophies like Marxism, accelerationism, etc. There's something I'll get to this maybe a bit later. What 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 it might be that occurs with German idealism? It's it's the revolution of thought. There's nothing like it before Kant. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and and it's it's extremely significant uh, what what happens there. I've mean, I've given a talk. I gave a talk last year at the Stoa on the meta crisis of the meta crisis, mm -hmm. where I get into what is that, what is actually the so-called meaning crisis or nihilism. What is it? Yeah. Maybe it's the split between being and thinking, yeah. which is what. Khan points his finger to, but we'll get to this. Um, and I met there also uh, Max Gottschlich, who's a, a professor of philosophy in Linz in Austria. I uh, would highly recommend his work. I recommend Stephen Holgate's work as well. He's now just published a new book on Hegel's logic. Uh, Max Gottschlich has published several papers on transcendental logic, etc. It's really important to understand, you know, to also have how, how Khan figures into uh, the scientific worldview of late modernity, etc. So we can get to the question of what does it mean to live in a Kantian world? Um, and so here's something uh, that, so, so these are the, the, the people who have been very important for me to understand. Uh, we so benignly call German idealism as if it were just another, you know, just another ism amongst others. And it was a, I took uh, years ago, I went to a seminar taught by Max Gottschlich and his teacher, Sören Hoffmann, his, um, yeah, one of his teachers, I guess, uh, who's a professor in Hagen in Germany. And they have a very, you know, usually Kant is considered an epistemologist. The first critique is just the question of, um, how do I know that I know? And, you know, if you know anything about the story of the history of the trans, uh, analytical epistemology, um, how this was started um, by a paper that the guy didn't actually want to publish. Um, so there's a bit of, a, say, a bit of a corruption of what Kant is. Kant is a logician. And I didn't understand this before because it's, it's very often not uh, mediated or taught in this way, but it, this is... If you want to understand Kant, I mean the Kant of the of the three critiques, and you have to understand Kant as a logician, uh, someone who invents transcendental logic at the moment when it's necessary. And Heidegger, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Kant, what, something that Max Gottschlich said actually has stuck with me ever since. He said, if you got on an airplane to come here to Vienna to take this seminar, then you are a firm believer in the validity of the operations of transcendental idealism. 
And I thought, what? Why? Well, because a priori, without any experience, without anything really happening, it is determined a priori that the kerosene will react in the way it is supposed to react. And that's posited. And you know, people wonder why Heidegger speaks of Gestell, the concentration of positing in terms of the essence of technology. Well, this is why. Because Gestell posits in such a way that before any experience, it can already be pre-calculated, pre-formatted what the outcome, the effect of something is. So I invite anyone who reads these you know, translations of Heidegger to get rid of the word and framing, which destroys the meaning of it. Gestell is not arbitrarily chosen. It actually comes out of this insight into the logic of positing, which begins to show itself with Kant and Fichte and the self-positing I, etc., which by the way is necessary for Kant to come up with because being and thought split. The unity is collapsed, collapses with our all, all, uh, all time favorite Scotsman, David Hume, or at least it becomes, the, the split becomes explicit. So um, the, and, and, and you can, and you know, what occurs with, with Kant as he's trying to save appearances, to speak in this Greek manner, trying to save appearances and access to the world, because as you know, Hume says, oh, you know, I don't know whether the sun will rise tomorrow or not, uh, which is basically nihilism. That's nihilism. Uh, it's, it's, it's a form of sophistry uh, and it's nihilism. Some might disagree, but I would think it's a form of sophistry. And um, here, with Fichte, something else occurs, namely a further, even though he struggles against it, a further subjectivization of the subject, where the, the subject or the I, in order to posit itself, and in order to maintain itself, which is already there, at least, you know, at least in, at least uh, to some degree in Kant. Um, Fichte, Fichte's eye, the transcendental eye, the self-positing eye of Fichte must posit itself in such a way that it ceaselessly strives against nature and ceaselessly strives to subdue nature to a level that nature becomes a fiction. And then hence you get the, you, you get this total reversal with Hölderlin and Schelling and Hegel who try to think and understand and articulate what a place is in nature, but without becoming, you know, fully immersed in nature, but also without using nature as a mere tool, as we still do today. So, so the one who opened everything up, right, was was Kant. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the necessity, the necessity that he was um, in his transcendental logic was speaking to was what was the necessity? What, what was what had lot had him do that? So, okay, I'll, it's very, very important. So, so look, uh, um, I don't know if you have any time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, where do I have to begin? Is it Parmenides? Is it? <laughs> I mean, you know, there's this, there's just no. Yeah. And by the way, I mean, th this is the caveat. Yeah. Uh, for any and all of these discussions that, and I'm speaking only about myself, um, is even if I try, I can probably only ever give sort of results. Or, or show certain trajectories, but I, this is not, so these are, I would say, these are not even path marks. They are invitations to think after and think through yeah. these moments yeah. um, and take them seriously. So this is the one caveat because, you know, I can say, oh, you know, Leibniz, this is what I'm going to do in a second. This is late day card, Leibniz, blah, blah, blah. But it, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, so I just say, you know, and by the way, very importantly, 
um, I think probably some of the, the people who listen to you do this anyways, is I would recommend anyone to take notes. Mm -hmm. I would recommend anyone to, to sit down, take notes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I always prefer handwritten notes. Uh, and then try and begin to think through certain things that are being said. Do they make sense? Do they not make sense? Uh, so here, I'll begin with Parmenides. Um, in a nutshell, mm -hmm. the, be <laughs> the beginning <laughs> of uh, what we now so benignly call Western philosophy is the moment where, in, in the most abstract sense, one can put this, and Parmenides does not say this, but he does say that you know, there's a necessity for there to be a unity between being and thinking or be between what is and knowing between you know thought etc so of course up for debate how to translate all of this but this is how traditionally this is understood yeah. and with um up until by the way descartes re-articulates and this is the moment of the, the birth of modernity uh re-articulates this principle of identity in terms of subjectivity. Right. Right. Ego cogito, ego sum certum est. I think I am, this is certain. Yeah. You see, that this is exactly this is not exactly the same, but it is it's it it it, it relocates thinking in the subject. Yeah. And then from this actually, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being is the identity with being is posited. And this is certain. So knowledge is now, or truth is now certainty. And up until, so what happens um, post Descartes is, and this is, you know, not doing it all justice, but uh, in, just to summarize this perhaps, there are two, you know, we usually think of it as there are two main isms, empiricism and rationalism. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly not wrong. Um, but what is it that empiricism does? Locke and Hume. And Hume is more consequential than Locke. Locke, what empiricists can do, by the way, this, so this is to all the empiricists out there, all you will ever be able to do is, <laughs> run, after, is run after experience. Mm -hmm. But I mean, when Locke says and it's all derived from experience, my question is, well, in what generates experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what generates and, and Hume is Hume is consequential. Hume is consequential. Hume, Hume, the Scotsman, uh, who once said in a letter when he was asked to uh, to to uh, publish another edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, he responded, "Oh, unfortunately, I am too fat and rich." <laughs> and now he was consequential. So he was honest. Um, but he was so consequential that he said, you know, Locke, you can't say that we can derive categories a posteriori. We cannot see substance causality from just experience. It would that it would have to be there a priori in what is experienced that to Hume is impossible. So we have here a breakdown with Hume of what empiricism can achieve. And we actually have already the horrors of nihilism spitting, which is that we be, be begin to lose access to the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see the necessity to think being in the world already spitting hundreds of years before Dasein. Right. And on the other side, you have what we now call rationalism. They just think in terms of the mind. Well, okay, what, what do they do? What, do, what is it that Leibniz does or tries to do? Mm -hmm. He applies categories to ens rationi to entities of the mind. Hmm. This is, by the way, just in, in brackets, this is one of the ways in which Kant categorizes the nothing as. Hmm. So if we apply categories to entities, of, for example, the monads, yeah. what we see happening is that formal logic is can have correct, coherent, um, so can, sorry, can have correct, coherent, uh, connections, uh, no, 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 si sorry, systems, um, which stand up inherently within themselves, they're perfectly correct, but they are not bound to content. I mean, show me a monad, right? So we don't, it's the question of, so um, what Kant sees is that both empiricism and rationalism cannot be, they cannot be synthesized, they cannot be combined, etc. No, 
they're, they're both at a dead end. Um, and what Khan is trying to do is to bind again logical form to content a priori. So that there is again an establishing of the, the unity of being and thinking, of course, and being as you know, um, objectivity of appearances and thinking is here representation. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a taming of reason, one could say, as Kant also puts it. So yeah. reason is going rampant, yeah. you know, constructing all these perfectly coherent systems, mm -hmm. but they don't speak to anything. They actually become also dogmatic. Right? This is why Kant is the oh, king well, of the right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Yeah. That's what Kant was uh, like a, a big thing that he was trying to overcome was dogmatism, right? And this is, by the way, this is what the Aufklärung is, the upclearing, the enlightenment, mm. um, which itself, of course, at this point has become dogmatic, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Other, other values, but um, so uh, the dogma and dogma is, you know, not just church dogma, but it is literally the dogma of formal logic that does that cannot ask. Well, what is formal logic? It, so formal logic can only operate; it's a technique, it's a technology, but it cannot ask, mm. what is logic? What are my, what are the axioms? What, is, what are any of my presuppositions? And what Kant does in, to simplify this is to set up without grounding though. It's a, it's a, you can say the first critique especially is a system, but this is, this is in quotation marks, a system of principal positings. I mean, when you read the text and it's one positing in terms of argument after another, a transcendental argument moved by positing, seeing whether it's possible, if it somehow is, then boom, this is secured and off we go. So what Kant does is he secures, so, hmm. I mean, what he, so much he does, he secures again, so he, he's trying to secure the conditions under which formal logic can work, but bound now to the world because we lose access to the world with a pure rationalism. Yeah. So, Yes. I mean, I think I remember when I put out one of the videos, you comment, yeah. commented something like, oh, this is what Hegel is doing. Yeah. Yeah. There was an introductory video to the first critique. Yeah. You know, what, yeah. Why is it that Hegel has to suspend with the principle of contradiction or has to suspend with any and all presupposition and must begin with being pure being? Right. Um, and, and again, I'll just leave this as a breadcrumb here. Gestell in Heidegger must, I think, must be understood against this logic of positing and Kant yeah. and Fichte. Yeah. It is the operations of Gestell are, I'll say it again, it's the concentration of positing. Yeah. It's, and so it's posited, something is posited as available, but, yeah. but never is it asked, do you, do you know, for example, in, in Heidegger it says in building, dwelling, thinking, or in the thing, one of these two, we actually thinks about what is a thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, what is a thing in itself? And that's, so this is what Kant does. I forgot this before, sorry. Uh, uh, Kant sets up, you know, tries to secure again, access to the world, but to what? To appearances mm. in their objectivity. So what does that mean? Um, he, that means we don't no longer have access to things as they are in themselves. Um, um, so, for example, for, for, for Aristotle, yeah. when a stone falls, what shows itself is something of the usia, of the unique presence of this particular stone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, for, for, for a modern physicist, what shows itself is the abstract law of gravity. So the the, 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 the ownness, as Heidegger would probably say, the essence of some of, of things, yeah, are crowded out. They're, they're they're pushed into the noumenal. By the way, also human freedom is pushed into the noumenal huh. by which he, so even though he tries to save freedom, he yeah. actually does end up saying uh, it's uh, 
it's 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 an undiscoverable faculty or this is almost a almost a correct quote so the way this is set up is that nature actually really becomes fiction this is i'm quoting stephen holgate uh from his book introduction to hegel where he says that kant is not too far away from nietzsche um where the world is just layer upon layer of human interpretation so nature itself uh becomes a fiction um and so in all so Maybe just to, to, to summarize, Khan tries to secure access to the world, to appearances, to phenomena. In doing so, so he tries to uphold the unity of being and thought. In doing so, he also asks because he also tries to um, eradicate contradiction. Yeah. What he can come up with is that objects of appearance must be without contradiction. And this is exactly what the sciences do. They produce, we produce in technology, but what do we produce? We oh. produce objects without contradiction. By the way, contradictio. Yeah. But you could say also it's, it's a counter saying, it's an opposition. There's yeah. no opposition. I mean, look at this thing. When anything you touch here has, there's, as you know, there's no resistance yeah. to anything. Oh, yeah. I touch it, I click, bam, 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 bam. Almost like anything pure, goes. The pure essence of some kind almost, right? No, no essence. Right. There's no essence. Right. There's no essence. Here. What is there? You know, there's yeah. appearance, but there's no essence. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's nominal ghosts. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> ghosts, <laughs> right. So, yeah, it's quite frightening, but that's a different story. But, yeah, oh. but, you know, we live in the Kantian world. Yeah. If you're a transcendental idealist, you've never asked you. You don't break out and, as Max Gottfried said, and you know you don't start being fearful and trembling when you get on an airplane because you just assume axiomatically that the kerosene will always react in the same way. Right. Um, yeah. People do get panic attacks on airplanes um, because maybe you know they're not fully haven't fully bought into the transcendental story. By the way, just as an aside to just uh, make this a bit weirder, mm -hmm. when they go and find the Higgs particle, so-called at CERN in Switzerland, right? Well, if if transcendental idealism is indeed true, then the particle does not exist before they find it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Right, right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so, yeah. so when, so with Hegel, right? Yeah. What is Hegel in response to? Well, Hegel is uh, consciously fully aware of um of being a, a direct heir to Kant, but also the, the science of logic is a is a recollection of thinking yeah. it's at, ev at every step at every step it recollects all of thinking cool. the science of, so it is a completion of transcendental idealism mm -hmm. And he says this, so you know, this is here's your slogan. This is what Hegel does. Boom! But, uh, but, but the science of logic, especially, is the completion fulfillment. But you know, don't think of this in terms of a, a finalization or you know, now we've done it and it's over. No, but it's 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 the becoming aware of the presuppositions that thought has always made. But which have which which have not yet been uh, huh. the word been uh, brought in or einholen is the term uh, have not been caught up with yet. Yeah. yeah. So presupposition that you know, this this trust you can almost say that being is thinking and that thinking is being that what is can be thought. Yeah. What is the condition of postmodernity? It, it, it is that we, you know, either I think whatever I want, haha, and I can be whatever I like, 
pure, by a pure positing of my will, yeah. or we have lost all trust and faith in that there is anything at all. Yeah. That it's all perhaps just a simulacrum or a simulation uh, that nothing's real, et cetera, et cetera. You know, these, all, all, of these, um, all of these expressions, they, they indicate something. Uh, this this split between being and thought, which is, which is, I think, the cri the crisis of all crises. Yeah. Um, and what what Hegel does, I'll say this on in, so the logic of science. Uh, sorry, the science of logic begins with being, yeah. pure being. <laughs> that's it. You know, that, that's sein, rein sein. Yeah. That's the first three words. Yeah. And I, don't, I forgot the there's a dash which is interesting there's a dash being pure being dash yeah and nothing else i think not, i don't know that's not true but something to that effect i don't have the book here right now um and so th this is and this is parmenidean and he also gets into parmenides later on right. but if the understand so what the understanding does and this tells us something about where we are why is our world becoming sterile why does Heidegger speak of the essence of technology as Gestell, as the concentration of positing? What is it that Gestell wants to do? It wants to hold on to something and determine what something is, is, mm. um, and this is this this is it, and it's determined. There's, you know, it's, it's fixed object. It's a fixed object, which with with, 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 with sorry. So think of the term uh, the, the 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 human genome. Right. Um, uh, yeah, this is it. We found the DNA. No, we found the DNA. That this is fixed in objectivity. It's perfectly timeless and determined, uh, and now we can operate with it. Yeah. Well, this is what this, the understanding does, but it is the act of reason to come in for Hegel mm -hmm. and be able to let go, because in the moment that something tries to hold on to itself, how does it hold on to itself? but only in opposition to another, to the other. Yeah. And it, it reason must allow for this dialectical movement. If not, it all collapses. It actually becomes a sterile dead world uh, of, of a fixed, you know, a, a fixed yeah. matrix uh, yeah. of perfect presence at hand that Heidegger would put it. And this is literally what Descartes says. For Descartes, everything outside of the thinking thing is just an extended thing. So there's fundamentally ontologically no difference between an animal, my body, the couch I'm sitting on and the universe. It's all just an extended thing. It's just dead matter. Right, right. right. But as such, it's been fixed by the understanding. Yeah, yeah. And dialectically reason must be able to let go um, so that we can articulate our place in nature, but also against nature, so that we're within and without nature at the same time. You could almost say right. it's a double negation. I, okay. So I, I negate my animality, but I also negate this negation. So come back to it through this movement of spirit into my being an uh, being also an animal, but not only. Right. So it's kind of in some sense let go, and the trust is. To trusting is trusting that what I'm, what I'm standing on in order to let go will come back and reveal themselves. Yeah. What actually? What is he trusting? And what what necessitates trust here? Okay. Say it again. The, yeah. the trust. What is he trusting? Huh? What is he trusting? You you just mentioned. I think you just mentioned Hegel's like saying no we. What is he trusting in order to well, let go? Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I didn't. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's an ancient Greek word right there. Ah, like, oh. oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> ancient Greek. Word. Yes, I'll quote you. I, 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 you know, I move back and forth in all the languages I fluently speak. Uh, <laughs> ancient Greek is one of them. My wife and I usually uh, converse. This is a Wednesday. Yes, this is our ancient Greek day. Tomorrow is Latin. <laughs> Friday is plastic Latin. So we move, you know, to the millennia, back and forth. Uh, no, no. So, um, oh, um, Eureka. 
Eureka, I think this is a very important question. Yeah, what? He, yeah, it's a very good way of putting it. I think uh, excellent way even. Um, what he trusts is so. So don't think of. I mean, in general, one shouldn't think of reason as a sort of a fixed structure. There, there is no. There are no laws of dialectics. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are no laws or principles of thinking that we, just, we could draw out of this. But you, you could say, you know, spirit itself is negativity. Spirit is negation. Yeah. Um, this is, and so the, the, the trust perhaps then is this, and then tentatively would say this, uh, but, you know, cautiously, um, that there is a trust between uh, that, that, that um, reason when, when it allows for something to let go, that yes, that there is, um, uh, there is a moment of, um, Of, of perhaps of not not collapsed, but uh, of something of something vanishing in the other, but the trust perhaps that this something returns and returns even stronger and more beautifully through the other, and so does the other. Uh, so perhaps this is the trust. You know, you trust in in that ne reason which is negative and dialectical in itself uh, can trust that by letting go of something, it actually becomes alive. Yeah. It's living, right? right. It's, it's living uh, and it's, 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 yeah. So, and you know, the people think sometimes, and that's the stupid way of putting it, not people, but it, I think sometimes um, it, it's assumed that when, you know, Hegel speaks of spirit or I, the idea, it's something goes like up in the heavens. So ideality, Ooh. the idea, is give you a very concrete example, but you can't, the thing is that we can't just you know say this and then operate with it. We have to be able to arrive at it logically, imminently, etc. Yeah. But here's the result, if you like: all of my organs, the heart, and the lungs, and the bloodstream that comes with it, the kidneys and the liver, and the stomach and the bowels, and uh, yeah. the mouth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These organs all maintain themselves in opposition and cooperation with all the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is I, so every organism, the animal organism included, the organism of plants, the organisms of plants included, is an exemplar of the idea. Yeah. It's the idea that shows itself in the beauty of the organism, in the self of nature, which is why Max Gottschalk says, you know, if we want to save nature, we shouldn't turn nature into a gas station, even if we do so sustainably, which, you know, the impulse is, isn't wrong, but the impulse is still under the auspices of, uh, of instrumental rationality uh, to, to be able to, um, to, to liberate nature or to save nature means to liberate nature to her own self, which not necessarily, and this is the, the more Heideggerian way of putting it, is perhaps not ever fully transparent to us. Hegel would not put it like this. Um, but in this sense, we no longer posit what something is before even anything occurs. So I say this again with Kant, never does anything show itself by itself. Uh -huh. And remember, what is the, the slogan at this point, the light motif of Husserl, of Husserl's phenomenology? Zurück zu den Sachen. Back to the things themselves, which Heidegger also quotes in Being in Time. And where we get to, isn't it? Um, where it wasn't, it wasn't in, in, in Herschel's. So is it the seventh Cartesian meditation? Like the, the, um, the categorical in, intuition where I, where I think Heidegger really heard Herschel. Herschel went on from it, which was this, this sense of how do we, I don't know what the technical terms are, but the um, essentially yeah. how does being yeah. Not a being, but being show itself to us precisely when it seems to presuppose 
all everything that we can see with our sen senses, everything we can think with, with our mind, right? It we can't find it anywhere. Yet, on some level, it's the only thing that we've ever has ever shown itself, right? Is existence as such, right, or being as such? And this is this is uh, just that sense of that showing of that's that's kind of like the question, right? What was well? It's what was Hegel's when he said pure being? What did he mean, actually? What did he understand? So it's it's not a reversal to ontology. Yeah. Um, but there is, in the preface to the first edition of the Science of Logic, Hegel says that thinking has undergone in the last five to 20 years a tremendous revolution, is Hegel's words. And no longer does the metaphysics of old, and of old means the metaphysics of 50 or 100 years before him, speak to us the question of whether the universe is mechanical or not, yeah. the question of the existence of God or not, uh, sorry, whether God exists or not. Yeah. Um, you know, the questions that, uh, that, that keep Descartes awake, that keep Leibniz awake, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. They no longer speak uh, yeah. to us. And there's a necessity to turn to logic and because logic is actually now, this is for the first time, is no longer an organon, it's no longer a technique or even a tool, yeah. but becomes itself science, which means for Hegel, becomes itself metaphysical. Yeah. So this is no longer a metaphysics that is ontological or naturalistic, as it still is, for example, for Leibniz. And after uh, Kant, uh, ontology is no longer possible. So it's... Mm. Um, Without going into this, so, so being pure being, it does not mean you know substance or some some highest entity. Um, and and in brackets, you know, people, especially because there might be a lot of um, listeners who are familiar with Heidegger. Um, Heidegger's understanding of metaphysics is mediated through the neo-scholastics, and is mostly, I have to say one that is that fits with early modernity leibniz for example mm -hmm. um but is not perhaps entirely accurate when it comes to hegel and i think heidegger knows this also yeah which is why sometimes in some of his notes on hegel he's a bit very you know almost too dismissive mm. um and also, there's another problem. Heidegger's understanding of, of, of Hegel is, was probably mediated by the Neo-Kantians, and it's a question whether the Neo-Kantians really understood Hegel as what Hegel is. But this, you know, this is ultimately what it comes down to. We have, we don't know, we understand or not see. Um, but in this reading of Hegel as a as a logician coming from the transcendental logic of of Kant, which is again, a system of principle positings that happens to hang in the air. Mm -hmm. There's no grounding it. Right. Um, to suspend, and what it actually does is, even though Kant sees this presupposition of all presuppositions, namely the unity of being and thought, he does not and cannot yet, this is not to any fault of his own, but he cannot yet bring in all the presuppositions of thought. And what Hegel is trying to do is just this, without having, so there's no horizon of presuppositions for philosophy, but there's the insight, the erkenntnis, the enlightenment, um, that one needs to, and also, by the way, you know, Kant, who wants to uphold formal logic uh, and its conditions, but, and also wants to uphold the principle of non-contradiction. Well, what does he run into in the first critique? The so-called antinomies of reason, where he does show that 
perfectly coherently and correctly within itself, the world has no beginning and no end. And on the other side of the page, uh, on the other page, uh, he says, well, no, the world was created and will come to an end. And both of these arguments work perfectly fine because, you know, you can, as he shows, you can apply categories to entities of the mind. Uh, they can be perfectly correct. Doesn't mean they're true. Doesn't mean it corresponds to the world. Yeah. Um, and what, what Hegel does at the beginning of being pure being is simply to suspend with anything and everything in all presuppositions and all that then can be thought is being pure being abstract empty um empty to intuition etc there's nothing else you can say about it there's no attribute there's no you know there's no silence there's nothing it's ha boom and then we are there it shows itself to be nothing but it's important to say it shows itself. It's That's not already right. nothing. It yeah. shows itself to be nothing. You see, the way we operate very often is, oh, I just pull out my principles and now I operate with them in the world, right? This is, let, let, let me apply this. No, no. It's being pure being and it's empty and it's this and it, oh, it's nothing. <laughs> it's a bit of a joke, right? Oops, yeah. it's nothing. Then you move on. And then on the understanding could say, well, that's a contradiction. So, and that, that's the book ends. Reason says, well, let go. Allow for the contradiction. Move on to nothing. So you move on to nothing. Uh, and by the way, if anyone's interested, um, there's a long dialogue with my friend, Philip Nicholas, um, on my channel, where we go over <laughs> literally mm. just the first three paragraphs mm. of the science of logic. Mm. Uh, for an hour or more uh, and, and Philip gets into the uh, it's amazing video yeah thank you um, and then nothing so nothing nothing you know, what can you say about nothing well you know haha not very much can you um, but yet it shows yeah <laughs> yet it shows and it's actually here that neg so negativity shows itself to be active yeah that's not nothing for being pure being you know this that's just it being pure being 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 there's no activity there's not, but the, the nothing begins to be active and then reason allows for something that the understanding which wants to hold on to well being is here and i've got nothing here on my table right i've got a table that i've drawn up yeah. there is no table for reason there are no stable objects and objectivity of course you know i'm i'm uh, i have a certain weight today and if i don't gain 10 pounds overnight, I will probably have roughly the same weight tomorrow. But over time, obviously, I used to be a lot shorter and uh, I will be a lot shorter again if I get yeah. to lift to 90 years. I will shrink again. So, you know, show me the stability of objectivity. It's not there. Yeah. Um, um, but, but so what reason allows for is the vanishing of being into nothing and nothing into being, of being into nothing and nothing into being. And this vanishing then becomes the first category of the logic, which is becoming. Wait, you becoming, said the, did you say the vanishing becomes the first category? Category? But becoming is the first category, yeah. but becoming is what springs from the vanishing of being Sorry, of yeah, from the vanishing of being into nothing and nothing into being. Right. right. And every time, every time the understanding in the logic as it progresses wants to hold on to something too rigidly, too determinately. Yeah. And reason would, and if, if in this moment reason fails to allow for uh, the other, for example, to come in and be in opposition to something the entire logic would break down and collapse back into pure being and in, into utter indeterminacy. Yeah. You see, by trying to over-determine, it collapses back into utter indeterminacy of being. Be, yeah. Being pure being is utterly indeterminate. Yeah. But there if is you nothing. stay there, that's, that's nihilism, right? Well, we could almost, yeah, we could almost say, you know, but this is going well beyond Hegel. 
uh, this is more in Schelling. Um, but so, the, so not to bring this into Hegel too much, but you could almost say the so being is not chaos. I'm not saying this, yeah. but poetically, perhaps I may be allowed briefly to, to say this if, if we're trying to hold on to too rigidly to something, we actually generate or help chaos come about yeah. uh, rather than freedom. Yeah. yeah in our place within nature. You know, we're trying to, by trying to predetermine every outcome of everything, yeah. it becomes a sterile, but weirdly enough, yeah. a sterile, completely chaotic place. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, fascinating yeah. to see this. But, you know. wow. Let him go. <laughs> so that's what he was doing. He was letting go. Man, it takes a lot of rigor to let go. Read yeah, it, it, yeah. In with Heidegger, Heidegger says in, yeah. in this essay, or this it was actually a speech he gave in order of the centenary of Konradin Kreutzer, the composer of the Kreutzer Sonata, um, who was also from his hometown, which is so the, the essay is now published as Gelastenheit in German, I think it's probably releasement or letting go, depending on the translation in English. Mm -hmm. Heidegger says we have to be able to say yes and no. To the technological tools yes. that we let that we let into our house, into our right. home, right? Um, and so, in this yes and no is obviously quite difficult to attain. But it is in this tension that we yeah. can achieve uh, freedom imminently, because we're not free when we when we uh, when we demonize technology. Because then we're then we're enslaved to it but from the other side you could almost say yeah um, it, it's just you know it's, it comes back to the question of the cave just to jump around like wildly as i want to do uh it, why do we return into the cave mm -hmm. why does the one who was freed return mm -hmm. only in the moment of return that we become free why because it is only then that we begin to see what is and what is not. It needs the critique, the cr cr critique. Yeah. Why is it called critique of pure reason? Is it just being critical? You know. <laughs> well, look. No. Right. Right. It means it comes from the Greek "krinein," uh, so I, um, you know, which, which, uh, or crisis, also from "krinein," mm. and "krinein" means to differentiate, to distinguish. Hmm. So you could read critique of pure reason also as you know a critique of the object reason, but also critique of as a subject. So hmm. it's reason critiquing itself, differentiating what is its place and what isn't. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, where are you just looking at what's 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 showing itself right there? Oh, I don't know. I'm just wondering whether whether you know. I've I've been able to maybe carve this out. Yeah. Why why did, what is it that occurs here? So there is for millennia almost the the implicit assumption or presupposition that being and thinking are not if not one, then they're unified in which way ever. And all of the sudden, this itself is pulled into question. And you mentioned before, is this nihilism you have? So yeah. Nihilism goes deep. It's not just the death of God. Um, not just that, you know, personal meaning breaks away or so. It's, you can also ask the question, why is it that we move in in late stage capitalism from crisis to crisis. Yeah. Everything is a crisis. There's a housing crisis. Heidegger already speaks of the housing crisis. Right, right. right. Yes. The yeah. We're in the 50s. There's a housing crisis in Germany. There's a housing crisis in the UK. There's a health crisis, as you know. Uh, there's crisis upon crisis. There's a financial crisis. Uh, there's a real estate bubble crisis. Uh, there's a crisis with money. There's crisis with everything and anything to no end, but not, never any distinction made. Yeah. 
never any anything they would say oh now now this is and this is not yeah. Yeah. um yes <laughs> so that so the um because i know you have to go here pretty soon but yeah, 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 anything minutes. about the anything about the course that you want to you want to talk about i love your courses <laughs> i want to make sure everyone goes to them uh well okay i'll so now down down from the from what was just happening um i think so, so i'll just talk about maybe the technical details mm -hmm. for this specific one there are six lectures which are usually in terms of just pure recording time one hour long so they're pre-recorded video and audio and then there's PDFs of all the texts and PDFs of the lecture notes. Um, and some people sign up and they just do the lectures. So all they do is go through them whenever they want to. You have what's called on the internet lifetime access. So yeah. as long as this, 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 it's called teachable, as long as they don't break down, uh, which I don't think they will, uh, people can, you can access this forever and ever. They won't be, it's not public. Um, and it's a coherent course. So it begins with Kant, and every single lecture reflects back on Kant, just to 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 yeah. show again and again how this they are in dialogue with him, and how this develops from Kant, what the problems are, what they're struggling through, yeah. and also what the horrors are that they see. Right? If you use very strong language, the Fichte sees the horror of nihilism. Yeah, something yeah. that Hume certainly does not want with his radical skepticism, mm -hmm. but ultimately ends up paving the way for. Yeah. And then I also offer seminars. So they actually start this Sunday on the 28th of March. Uh, they run for seven consecutive Sundays. And then we have an eighth one, which we still have to determine if people can give a talk. And what these are for, so I, I lead them. And I do answer questions, uh, but they're also there for people to meet others. Yeah. Um, sometimes I say, you know, other village idiots uh, who hadn't been, wouldn't have been able to uh, realize they're not alone. Yeah. Uh, I am trying to read and understand philosophy, and their breakout sessions, which are which I now have at about twenty minutes. Two of them in the beginning, because it gets and usually it. You know, you never know what, I actually never know where the seminars will go. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You do in the breakout sessions and I just say, so who wants to go first? Hmm. I don't know. And it's just, it goes wherever it goes. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it brings people together. They usually they start, as you know, there's this forum that I have, which people can use them and they can join reading groups or start their own. Um, and you can give a talk, which is something that sometimes, you know, is, is, is not actually one of the, you know, some very, sometimes it's quite academic, but some of the, someone, Taylor, um, played swing, ch uh, swing chairs drums last time. <laughs> right, right. Because um, I, I focused in the Parmenides lecture and the other course, yeah. on absence you know this is something that's often forgotten i think in parmenides parmenides speaks about absence yeah yeah um and and then taylor said well in chess you know it says swing feel on some of the note sheets yeah. but you can't quantify swing feel there's no way of quantifying this <laughs> um, just a swing feel it's actually a feeling of absence being able to listen to the absence uh and the yeah. pause yeah um so that was that was you know, this is right. what it would be like. Um, so they, they are basically the seminars are there. So yes, the, I'm there. I lead them. I will be strict. You know, this is what this means. This is not what this means. But it's also, but it's also <laughs> there for people to meet and experiment uh, and learn. And actually, this time I'm quite uh, grateful and blessed that Philip Nicholas. Mm -hmm. um will be my teaching assistant oh great so i think 
I'm not sure whether he has the time because he also has to finish his PhD on Hegel, of all people. Um, uh, but he will be there for several of the sessions and will teach um, one seminar himself, Fantastic. which is a recap seminar. So we do three seminars on Kant and Fichte, and then he teaches one yeah. um, with, um, which is just on Kant and Fichte. There's no new reading. It allows students to get into this strange language and thought, and he also touches on Hegel. And by the way, maybe I should mention this, uh, Philip will teach a full course on Hegel at the end of this year. Oh, great. Right the end of the summer. Oh, yeah. great. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Right on. So, yeah, he will teach, uh, but it, very broadly. So it will be on the logic and dialectics, mm -hmm. and but also on freedom, the yeah. philosophy of rights, yeah. uh, aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Etc. And so come on down to the guild, everybody. <laughs> come on down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would be good. I mean, I actually, so quite often it, it happens that people uh, say to me, you know, I like listening to, to you and Guy speak. Mm -hmm. And then at some point they end up signing up. Mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately, I think so the courses are there for anyone who wants to take the study of philosophy to a next level um, because it's focused. And as I also said to Adam Robert in, in, that, in that podcast, I try and hold myself to the highest standards, um, meaning I'm, I'm, <laughs> should I say this? I'm killing myself writing these things. Yeah. Uh, it's just, yeah. I, uh, like emails at this at this now it's getting better emails are no longer just flushing right through me. It's like why are people because i'm sitting here so this is week seven of writing i'm usually writing for about 10 12 hours a day um and <laughs> <laughs> yeah why well, you know this is what you have to i think you have to do this because i would i would beat myself up if i didn't if i didn't think i had at least to some degree grasp what may or may not be going on or at least where i see i don't understand yeah. something that's yeah I understand. um yeah so but so i and that's the claim my claim is that it's possible to teach postgraduate level courses that are serious that yeah. take people seriously and i mean not the thinkers them too but also the participants right. Um, and by taking them seriously, uh, they grow, yeah. I think we all do. And overall, um, the most important part of, 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 especially of the seminars is just to get people together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And as you know, you know, you've had people on who could like Daniel and Molly and others. Yeah. Yeah. Who come through the courses. Yeah. And Daniel's been fantastic. Oh right? yeah. Daniel's amazing. I love that guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I always say that that spoke Tsaruba. Yeah. He's got the perfect name. Absolutely. You know, it's it's interesting because like usually people that the that, that people usually when they think about philosophy, for the most part, their eyes kind of glaze over, right? <laughs> because they think of something, I don't know abstract yeah. and intellectual or something like that and i my experience is it's if anything it's about it's about being to really listen to a philosopher philosophize is to one is to get inside and in some sense give let yourself be concerned right about the matter in which he's articulating it that's actually to, to hear him and the way you end up doing is you end up kind of in some sense what is it loving existence through that philosopher and the way that he is doing that right and it's a very warm but also uh highly listening listening is the thing that i think that i I've, I've gotten out of this more than anything of philosophy is how to listen and to be able to hear right things. 
uk emu alatologu akusantas homologain sophonistin henpanta inai. Not to me. Yeah. logos. The logos. It is wise to co-respond. Hen panta enai. One is many. And this is the beginning of Trevon idealism. Hen panta enai. How can we think the one and the many, the manifold in the one, identity and the difference in such a way, as Heidegger says, it takes thinking 2,000 years to notice this. This is why even the Janava perhaps sometimes says, the thinking is about the sound like the sound that's the thing about like so what are we going to talk what, what i really got in basic questions and reading reading basic questions is where he he really brought home in that to me anyways of that plato and aristotle that really thinking was more perceiving right and then later on it became you know, the rational animal, they like became inside of someone's head with all the issues that we're kind of like all start dealing with. But this original sense in which thinking was more, at least what I got from what he was saying is, was more about seeing, it was more about, it was more about perception, right? Like seeing the look in things, right? Like the, the, that sense of we're bringing your, your connection into the world, basically. Um, that has, that's actually been my, that's been my experience in, in grappling with philosophy and reading these guys is that it really is, is what you end up, well, you end up doing the thing that you were just doing. You were like, right before I asked you about the court, like the course, you, you had to bring yourself back <laughs> from somewhere and it just, you were sitting there watching, listening to this thing that's unfolding, right? That that where a whirlwind i don't know what it is yeah but sometimes sometimes it comes about sometimes it doesn't yeah um and the art or the mandate it's both it's an art and it's a mandate is to keep the fire alive yeah yeah i don't care about it yeah uh, yes but and this is the difficult part right um this is perhaps yeah, what's the difficult Sorry? Yeah, what's the difficult part? Well, to, to keep the fire burning. Yeah. yeah. Um, and as you know, very often it can happen that we, you know, we read someone like Heidegger or, or Nietzsche and we see that there's an insane, intense fire in these texts. But, yeah. um, and philosophy is a fire, but it's, it's it also every fire can burn you to stay in that metaphor um and it's it, it's philosophy is also disappointing this and toyshant in german it's it's disillusioning so um there isn't a grand say spiritual awakening and then we are enlightened and walk around like uh, the elves or the elves or whatever they are in lord of the rings um it's actually you know the, almost the the more disillusioning uh, it is about the world, the more uh, wondrous um, the world again becomes, yeah. strangely enough. Yeah. Um, so it's right under and, your feet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it becomes, it be, and Heidegger says this at some point where he says, you know, my question is very simple. Yeah. It's, it's a very simple question. Actually, the whole thinking is very simple. It's difficult in the in the execution, yeah. but the, th the question is simple: What is being? What does it mean to be? Um, but uh, it, it the to keep the, the fire burning is um, that will be the difficult task, uh, or is the difficult task for for anyone? Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think then it's uh, the responsibility to to let go and stop <laughs> immediately. When you don't feel the fire anymore yourself, when it's no longer there, mm -hmm. then you must go and be an accountant. Nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. um, but you, there's no, there's, because if not, it becomes artificial. Yeah. When it becomes artificial, you're just generating more simulacra, and that's the one thing we don't need. So, yes, yes. 
<laughs> to keep the fire going. What's that song? Keep the fire. That's a song, isn't it? No, Send the logos. The logos is, you know, haircut is the fire, right? Puraison. Yeah. The living fire. Right. Was it Wednesday? Greek or was it Latin today? I forgot. Anyway, so, yeah. <laughs> All right, my friend. So good talking with you. Peace. <laughs> See you soon. Bye. Bye, ciao.